Raider Nation, thank you for joining us on the Only Nation podcast, brought to you by the Raider Ramble. My name is Heidi, but you may know me as Kevlar Prom Dress or even Raider Ladybug. I'm here with Raider Homer and T3 Raider Facts, and we're ready to talk some Raiders football together. Always ready to talk Raider football, and training camp is right around the corner. Like you said, Homer, training camp is finally here, and this year it's live, so let's go. Today on the show... We'll get a couple of pieces of news just prior to the beginning of training camp, and then we are going to explore an interesting topic. We're going to take the next man up approach and look at several key players who may need to step up in case someone goes down with an injury. Now, we're not wishing injuries on anyone, but we know that they do happen, and we just need to be prepared. We're knocking on wood. So that it doesn't happen, and we're knocking on wood because we're with you. All right, Raider Nation, this is the Only Nation podcast, and we want to hear from the Only Nation. So call 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. Leave us a voicemail or send us a text. Here's the latest Raider news. Raiders president Mark Bidain stepped down earlier last week. Coming to the Raiders as a training camp intern in 1991, Bidain stayed almost 30 years with the Raiders organization and served a central role in the team's move from Oakland to Southern Nevada. Although the timing of the announcement sent shockwaves through the organization, Bidain issued a statement saying that it was time for him to focus on his family and look ahead to other pursuits. We here at the Only Nation podcast wish Mark Bidain nothing but good things going forward. Absolutely. You know, he did a hell of a job, you know, being with the team that long, 30 years. I mean, I think he he started right uh, picking up people from the airport and things like that. I mean, I'll do that. Just hire me, Mark Davis. Hire me. I'm in. All right. Uh, and then he climbed all the way through the ranks and helped the Raiders get a brand new stadium. You know, once a Raider, always a Raider. Good luck to him and his family with, in whatever endeavors that they have down the road for themselves. I wish him good luck. You know, I've heard all kinds of theories over the past couple of weeks as what was the main motivation for him stepping down. And you know, it really doesn't matter. The bottom line is we've all been through a tough year. COVID impacted lots of families in lots of different ways. And he says that he just needs to spend more time with his family. I'm going to take the man at his word. Now, I do know that he could probably do some good things in helping to maybe get a baseball team or maybe even a basketball team to Vegas as well. But that remains to be seen, and that's totally up to him. But I want to wish Mark Benain nothing but good things and kudos for the wonderful job that he did for the time that he was with the Raiders. I think the man just wants to go fishing, sit back at a baseball game, eat his peanuts, and relax. He's earned it. He's carried on as a well son, and he's earned his rest when his day was done. Amen to that. Now, we now know who will be presenting Tom Flores into the Hall of Fame. It will be Caroli Davis, the wife of legendary owner Al Davis. Flores commented, We're keeping it in the Raiders family, and I couldn't think of a better person to send me into the Hall of Fame than Caroli Davis. She is thrilled, I am thrilled, and Mark Davis is thrilled. For the record, Miss Davis's presentation will be videotaped and not conducted in person and will be played at the ceremony just prior to Flores's induction. You know, I am really excited to hear the words of Al Davis's wife, a longtime partner, and this will probably send a shiver or two up my spine, but uh, D- Carol Davis, Caroli Davis, has been connected with the Raider organization. Uh, since Al Davis first came in in 1963, and they've been at it side by side. And and, and I couldn't be happier for this association to bring her in and to connect it with Tom Flores uh, and bring him in the Hall of Fame. I think it's perfect. I love the fact that the Davis family still owns the Raiders. You know, they deserve to present Tom Flores at the Hall of Fame. You know, Al did it for a lot of legendary Raiders, and now 
Caroli gets to do it for another legendary Raider. You know, and I love that Mark Davis was excited about it as well. You know, his time will come. He's going to, you know, present people in the, NF, or in the NFL Hall of Fame down the road. I, I would say maybe John Gruden, you know, Derek Carr wins a couple Super Bowls, definitely Derek Carr. Yeah, I said it. But, uh, you know, it, it's awesome to see the Davis family watch all of these successful Raiders go into the Hall of Fame and be there to speak for them, you know, and, and, and enjoy the moment with them. So I'm happy for the Davis family and for Coach Flores. The NFL announced new protocols last Thursday that make unvaccinated players heavily responsible if games get a COVID-related cancellation. The memo stated that if a game cannot be rescheduled within the current 18-week schedule and is canceled due to an outbreak of unvaccinated players on one of the teams, the club with the outbreak will forfeit the contest. In addition, the NFL said that if a team's unvaccinated COVID outbreak causes a game to be rescheduled, that team has to pay the travel expenses for the other team, and if rescheduling is not possible, both teams' players lose out on their weekly salary. The team that caused the cancellation also faces additional fines and penalties from the league. Now, this article and this story makes me want to get out my tinfoil hat. You know, this is a big deal, you know, in today's society, right? We're asking our athletes that are performing for us, entertaining us to take a vaccination to do that. You know, and the reports, you know, they seem to be pretty good, but it's a choice thing. I understand the players, you know, are concerned about that. Some players like Jalen Richard, but... To me, this is bigger than the NFL. You know what I mean? Are they going to start asking me at work to do this? So, like I said, you know, I don't want to be the conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but it's kind of concerning, you know, that this is where we're going. Um, you know, I think we talked about this, you know, a little bit in earlier episodes, you know, uh, the how the changes from COVID or how COVID was going to change society. And this is definitely one of those key changes. Uh, Of course, then again, as a fan, it's like, you know, I hope they take them right because we want to watch football and win a Super Bowl. But then that, you know, hey, I got to be willing to take it as well. So this is a big step for our society coming out of this uh, this uh, pandemic. This is something that, you know, a lot of people are not going to like and a lot of people will like. So I don't know. This is definitely a weird situation. Again, I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on and I'm just going to step out of this conversation for the rest of this episode. Certainly the NFL's way of saying we're not going to require you to have the vaccine, but if you don't get the vaccine, there are lots of consequences lined up which could affect not only you, but your team, your teammates, the fan base, everything. So uh, the warning signs are up. So it's just almost like if you grab your surfboard and go out to surf when they tell you not to, uh, uh, the, the freedoms are there, uh, the choices are there, but the consequences are pretty well lined up as well. So, again, the NFL's saying you don't necessarily have to do it, but if you don't, here's what can possibly happen. So, cautionary tale to all NFL players. Yeah, but if you don't go riding into that pounding surf, it's pretty simple, but what will happen? Nothing's going to happen. If you do take that shot, there's no guarantee on what will happen. It's still experimental. That's asking a lot of pressure to put on somebody. You know, I have my own personal views on it. Uh, I'm not here to say somebody should or shouldn't get it done. That should be up between you and your doctor. Um, but it does get a little tinfoil hattish when you look around and see, you know, these employers and and organizations that are starting to require it. How far is too far? How far is not far enough? Uh, It's a question. And then to wrap up the signings of this year's draft class, the Raiders locked down third round draft picks, safety linebacker Divine Diablo, and defensive end Malcolm Kuntz. They both signed four-year deals worth $5 million each. I'm happy they have everybody signed, you know, right before training camp. Let's see if Malcolm Kuntz can be half of what Khalil Mack is, right? Fingers crossed. Hope that works out. Divine Diablo, I'm very excited about this guy. I believe him and Tanner Muse are going to offer us some versatility on defense. 
size and speed as well. Uh, you know, this is the league is changing, right? It's becoming more of a passing league. So in these nickels and dimes, you got to have some guys that can hit. You know what I mean? These tight ends are tearing up the NFL. He's received big receivers, you know, r- bigger running backs running in the field, in the backfield. You know, uh, hopefully these guys, you know, Divine Diablo provide that depth, you know, uh, that we're going to need in the linebacking core. So, but I'm glad we got these guys signed just before training camp, you know, so good thing. Let's get it done, Raider Nation. Homer, you said it all. I mean, these guys are motivated and they're ready to come in. And I'm just excited because unlike last year where we didn't really have a training camp, we're we're ready to see the guys strap on the pads and, and, and get some coaching, get some actual training and some teaching going on. And I really believe that Gus Bradley and that defense can really impress upon these young guys how to play the game and how to maximize their own potential. So I'm just looking forward to this coming week and the coming weeks. And I can't wait to see that first preseason game against Seattle. And some sad news to pass along. Former Raiders offensive coordinator Greg Knapp, who was set to begin this season as the Jets' new passing coordinator, died as a result of injury sustained during a biking accident in Northern California. He was only 58. The Raiders released a statement saying they were both saddened and stunned, and the team offered its thoughts and prayers on behalf of the entire Raider nation to Coach Knapp's family, during this extremely difficult time. And I just want to personally offer up prayers and support for Greg's wife, Charlotte, and their three daughters he leaves behind, Jordan, Natalie, and Camille. You know, once again, we're reminded that life is precious and it's over. So let's all be thankful for what we have. And I want to suggest everybody go out and hug on your family. Yeah, prayers to Greg's wife and his daughters. You know, they're going through a tough time for sure. Um, you know, and then that their life is destroyed now, you know, and they'll have to, you know, move forward together. And the, the, apparently this was a younger guy that, you know, didn't involve drugs or alcohol, but who knows if what he was doing. It was a, uh, you know, a terrible accident. Hopefully it doesn't destroy two families or, you know, so don't text and drive, right? Uh, pay attention. Watch out for bikers, uh, cyclists, you know, they annoy the hell out of me too. But they're out there doing their thing, and I damn sure don't want to be responsible for uh, somebody losing their father or anybody in their family. So be careful. Watch out for cyclists out there, Raider Nation. You know how we do it. We're always watching out for people, so let's be sure. In the name of Greg, once a Raider, always a Raider, watch out for the cyclists out there. Yeah. Earlier reports were that the driver who hit him was not involved in any um, drunken driving or texting. Uh, that course remained to be seen but initially it looked like it was just a tragic accident yeah yeah and i don't you know mean to say that that person was doing one thing or the other i'm just saying let's just all be careful and watch out for cyclists out there because one split second changes lives all right and for this week's discussion we were going to take a little bit of a different track Now, we all know injuries occur every year, and whatever team is best able to overcome injury has a much better chance of success. So, looking across the board, each of us is going to focus on a particular player or group of players who we see as being able to be that next man up. The one who will need to step up in the event that one of our starters goes down during the year. Now, we're not hoping that any of this happens, we're just simply asking, what if? T3, why don't you go first? Who do you have? All right, thanks. Now, I'm going to focus on the linebacking core. Now, I've been very critical of the fact that the Raiders haven't used the draft to bolster this position, especially over the past couple of years. I was happy with the free agent signings of Nick Kwiatkowski and Corey Littleton during last year's offseason. But I was really hoping that the Raiders would have drafted linebacker Kenneth Murray out of Oklahoma instead of Damon Arnett in round one of the 2020 draft. And when you look at the production of those two players over the course of their respective rookie years, I think most everyone could agree that Murray showed more promise and had a much better season. And I think that certainly could have translated to more success for the Raiders on defense last year. But that was last year. Now, if you drop back a year previous to that, I had the Raiders drafting a linebacker in the third round back in 2019. Not Tanner Muse, but a guy by the name of Alex Highsmith, who was drafted by Pittsburgh and had a productive rookie year. 
And when you compare Highsmith's numbers to a year-long IR on behalf of Mr. Muse, well, once again, you got to wonder. Now it's 2021. Kwiatkowski, Littleton, and Morrow are all coming back. Morrow has shown improvement. Littleton needs to return to form, and Nick just needs to stay healthy. But what about the depth? Suppose somebody goes down. Well, the most immediate answer, I think, is someone who could actually challenge for a starting spot this year, and that's newcomer Darren Lee. A former first-round pick by the Jets in 2016, he's had his troubles. In fact, in the talent on one hand, trouble on the other hand category, he reminds me a little of former Raider linebacker Rolando McClain. Now, Mike Mayock even said when Lee came out in the 2016 draft that he believed that Lee was the third best overall linebacker available in that draft. He's been steady, but not spectacular. He's been suspended because of attitude, and he was also hit with a suspension for PEDs. He embodies that fast, physical, ball-out philosophy that Gus Bradley's been talking about during the offseason. And if Lee is really on his game, I see good things happening. So if he comes in motivated, I see Darren Lee being the natural candidate for next man up in case any of the other linebackers go down, provided he's not already starting by week one. Now, looking at the rest of the linebacking room, it's pretty thin in terms of proven talent. This is where I think Divine Diablo can start to separate himself from the pack. I like his overall skill set, strength, and speed a little bit better than Tanner Muse, but I haven't seen Tanner play in two years, so I think my skepticism is pretty warranted. I don't think Diablo will crack the starting lineup by week one, and perhaps not even during the season unless somebody goes down to injury. But linebacking coach Richard Smith can work with Double D and improve on season-long performance that earned him all conference honors in the ACC last year. Clemson's conference, by the way, and will help me feel a whole lot better about the linebacking core toward the end of the season. So for the linebackers, I think the first next man up is Darren Lee. And right behind him, I have Divine Diablo. Now, Homer, I know you like our boy Tanner Muse, so let me offer this up. I think Tanner, based on the college game fill I've seen, is actually better suited to play that box safety position, which may mean you'll see some of that in practice and maybe even during the preseason. Maybe, maybe it could be that way, but I believe Tanner Muse on the weak side is going to be a really good option for us. I know, you know, you're talking about Divine Diablo, but he's on the pub. Of course, y'all were talking about you weren't surprised about that. Um, but I, I believe they took Tanner Muse for a reason. Like I said, he's that six foot two, 240 frame, four, four, 40. Uh, the guy, you know, can play. Uh, and he's a hybrid player. So I, in, you know, with Divine Diablo, right, uh, on the pub right now, we'll see what happens. But this is Tanner Muse's time to really shine. You know, and Darren Lee, you look at, you read up on his, on his stats and things like that. It looks like he has, he's competitive. You know what I mean? He wants to play. He's not afraid to play in the NFL. He has some, a return touchdown, some sacks, you know, solo tackles. You know, he's all over the place. You know what I mean? You know, so that's great for our team overall. But, you know, my belief is that Tanner Muse has got that that next man up on the weak side. Because, like, let's say Kwiatkowski went down, right? I see Morrow going to the middle, right? And then Muse coming in on the weak side. If Littleton went out, I could see them trying Muse on that side to cover the tight ends as well. He's got that big body. He's got the speed. You know, we'll see. But I, I believe in this linebacking core. I believe that they know how to stay healthy. You know, we haven't had a lot of issues with Morrow dealing with injuries, right? Uh, Kwiatkowski missed some in, uh, some games due to the pec injury, right? But he came back and played badass, you know what I mean? So he seems, you know, sturdy. Uh, Littleton didn't miss any games, you know? So, uh, you know, fingers crossed, right? But I believe this is a pretty good linebacking core. And, of course, across the board, we have a bunch of young guys. But, you know, we got the key coaches in place now. You know, everybody feels confident about Bradley, right? Not everybody felt confident about Gunther. You know, you know, I know I feel confident about Gruden. I know that y'all feel confident about Gruden to a certain extent. You know what I mean? I know that y'all don't want him to be as conservative. But, uh, you know, I, I just think that we're right there with our coaches and they're going to be able to utilize some of this young talent that, and turn them into professional football players, starting with Tanner Muse if he had to step in for an injured Nicholas Morrow or somebody. And I can really see Divine Diablo just, Standing there chomping at the bit, ready to go. I don't know how serious his injury is. I believe that it 
had to have been significant enough because it has delayed his signing for quite some time. I de- delayed it till uh, he and Koontz were the last players signed out of the draft class. And whatever it is, it, it's been nagging. So that's what concerns me about seeing him chomping at the bit, ready to go. Tanner Muse, I, I've, I've been waiting all year. <laughs> been waiting all year to see him, see what he can pull off. I got, I'm rooting for you, buddy. Not sure how much faith I've gotten you, but I'm rooting for you. And somebody has to step it up in the middle line backing core. Somebody has to. Um, it has notoriously been our weakest defensive position for so long. We are always weak as far as the defensive backfield, but it's our linebackers that are really the ones that have been hurting. And that's where we need we need everyone to step it up. Um, not just the starters, but the starters and the next men up. We need them to both be able to play together and do it at the same time. I know it's been a long time since we've had a great middle linebacker, but I'm telling you, Kutowski is that guy. I mean, he graded high in pass coverage, right? That's something that we need. You know, he made the one-handed athletic interception. You know, those are kind of the kind of spark plays that we need that he can provide, but not just that, the down and dirty plays. When you watch him run to the sideline and hit, you know, a lineman or a tight end into the blockers and just blow up the whole play, those kinds of plays are the what makes a great middle linebacker. If he can't get to the ball, disrupt the play, and that's where Kwiatkowski he, he he excels in. He's pretty strong, so I do feel confident in that. As far as depth, though, I know it's there. After that, it's a big fall off for sure. All right, Homer, who do you have next? For me, it's the offensive line all across the board, right? Rodney Hudson, uh, one of the greatest centers we've ever had. The best, I believe, since Jim Otto. We've said that plenty of times. Of course, you know, he wasn't grading out as well as John Gruden wanted him to when it came to run blocking. So they moved on to save a little bit of money. And they believe in Andre James. You know, of course, they re-signed Nick Martin. So let's say... Andre James goes down, you feel confident that Nick Martin can step up. He's going to be that next man. I think last year, one of seven players to allow one sack. So I believe he's that next man up guy at the center position. But of course, we got this whole reworked offensive line, right? Another big guy that we need to step up, if need be, is John Simpson, right? Coming into his second year. Richie Incognito has been playing for a long time. If he stays healthy, he's going to roll great. But if if he re-aggravates that Achilles, you know, we need John Simpson to step right in there, man. That's what we got him out of Clemson for, a big road grader. You know, he's going to need – because, look, this is what I'm saying. That's the theme of this reworked offensive line. Uh, When we're inside the three, we don't want to be worried about running tight ends and, you know, in the flat and all this and that. We want to run straight at them, right? And I know that's not everybody's uh, favorite approach, but remember, right, when Zach Crockett came on the field – Everybody in the stadium watching at home, at, you know, on TV, announcing the game, every, the opposing team, everybody knew what was going to happen and they got it done every time. So uh, that's what John Gruden wants to do. So he's got a guy like, you know, Richie Incognito that can road grade. You know, they went and they got Denzel Good, who was playing well, you know, uh, run blocking as well. But, you know, that's another guy. If uh, Alex Leatherwood doesn't work out, you know, you don't really believe in. Jared Jones Smith, right? I mean, that's kind of questionable. He hasn't even played more than a few games in a few games, I believe. You know, so you got, but you got Denzel Good, the next man up on that whole offensive line, right? He can play guard and tackle, so he can move to the outside, and then you you move Lester Cotton in. So these are what I'm looking at. These next man up, Lester Cotton Senior, Jared Jones Smith, Nick Martin, John Simpson, and of course Heidi's favorite, Brandon Parker. You know, we don't we believe in, in Coach Cable, right, and his ability. But with Colton Miller, you know, he played the first year through all the injuries, so he's been so solid. But we'll see, you know, is Brandon Parker going to be able to stand up and be the next man up at left tackle, you know? Or do you move, you know, Alex Leatherwood over there? You know, get, he kind of gets, you know, we're going to have, we may have to face this situation like we did last year where we're shuffling 
the entire offensive line. So for me, it's all the backups, you know, because I mean, Brandon Parker, you know, he was drafted to play in Alex Leatherwood's spot. So he at least has to be able to back somebody up and step it up like he did last year in a couple of games. He played well, but then, you know, he started to kind of fall off a little bit. But uh, that's my major concern. You know, when we talked about players to watch Andre James. You know, he's got Nick Martin breathing down his neck. You know what I mean? Uh, Denzel Good, you know, he can back up, you know, the right tackle and the right guard. But if Denzel Good goes down, you know, we got Jared Jones, like I said a little while ago, he, he's in the right tackle spot, but he can also play guard. So we got, you know, I feel comfortable with the right guard position if we had to move around. I believe Lester Cotton Sr. and Jared Jones can handle that a little bit better. Let, let's say if Alex Leatherwood went down, Good went out to right tackle. You know, those guys could slide in the right guard, but that's what we're going to be facing, I think, this year is, you know, if Alex Leatherwood, one, doesn't work out or gets injured, Denzel Good's going to move to the outside, and then you got Lester Cotton Sr. and Jared John Smith right there at the right guard, and if Rich Incognito gets re-aggravates that Achilles, we need John Simpson to come right in and play his ass off, and if Andre James can't get the calls right or, you know, it's just not, he's completely lost, Nick Martin, step right up, man. You know, you know, and I know that you talked about Jim Morrissey a whole lot, uh, you two. Uh, so we'll see what happens, you know. But Sam Young last year, you know, he played his heart out, but he couldn't stay healthy. You know, so that's another option at right tackle. But, you know, the whole offensive thing, you know, of course, is based, you know, offensive line has to play well. But the whole style that Gruden is going to has to, they have to really dominate that line of scrimmage. And so, you know, hopefully nobody goes down. Because there are a lot of young guys. Again, Simpson in his two year, uh, his second year. Uh, Lester Cotton Sr. in his second year. Jared Jones Smith, I think, is in his first year, right? If not his second year. Nick Martin, you know, handful of years. Parker in his third or fourth year. You know, these pretty young guys, except for Parker and Nick Martin, you know. So to me, they got to have that next man up mindset. You know, it's going to come as a surprise to you, but I do not think that Brandon Parker is the worst possible option we have as backup on some of those positions. Uh, He has improved a lot, and he has turned into more of a swing tackle that can um, cover from side to side. Does that mean that I'm comfortable with him doing it? No. But do I scream in despair at the thought of Leatherwood going down and and him having to take a few snaps in his place? I I can handle that. I've gotten to the point where I can handle that. Parker has worked very hard on improving, and I think that he has improved a great deal. Um, I think the most realistic one to go down would be Richie Incognito simply because of the injuries and his age. But I think that we have plenty of guys, young guys in there that will be able to step right up and take care of him. Even Sam Young, uh, he has, he's got some age on him, but he's still been able to stay in there and throw his weight around and, and do a good job. It's been the injuries that have been lacking with him though. But Brandon Parker... I, I'm i not going to scream at the first thought of him stepping foot on the field. Second thought, maybe, but first thought, no. Um, but I think there's a lot of depth, and I think that with a guy like Cable in charge, uh, we're going to see some real good come out, of, come out of that depth this year. And Heidi, I agree with you on both counts. Brandon Parker really has improved a lot over the last year, and I'm and I'm not. I, I wouldn't be uh, treating things as dreadfully as I was as I would have last year. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned, which I'm totally in agreement on, is Richie Incognito. Here's a 38 year old who's coming back from an Achilles injury. Now, an Achilles injury in and of itself is difficult, but when you compound the age and and the the, the wear on the tires on top of everything else. I'll be honest with you. I could be completely wrong, but I don't have him penciled in as a starter for week one. I have John Simpson penciled in at that guard position. Now, I could be completely wrong, and I hope I am because I would like Richie to come in and contribute as much as he can, as long as he can. But I just don't see him coming back and being as effective 
after after being gone for a year with his age and with that Achilles injury, which I know is a difficult one to overcome. But in the end, when it looks like the next man up for the offensive line, we all know that it's a it's a team game. I mean, it's it's all the offensive line working cohesively together. So, and Tom Cable, I trust, and and I trust that he's going to make the adjustments he needs to get the guys in that need to be in, and 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 work wonders again. Uh, so I have no problems in saying that that I, that I trust him implicitly in putting this offensive line together and getting the best five guys on the field, getting them to mesh and having them have this offense step up. I totally agree. And I would not have been able to say that five years ago, but I totally agree. All right, Heidi, who do you have for us? Who do I have? I have the most obvious one. If this guy goes down, we are screwed unless we have somebody who can cover for him. And that is our fearless leader, Derek Carr. If Carr, if Carr goes down, we're in trouble. We need a good backup. And thank God for the last year, we have had a good backup. Marcus Mariota has not only shown himself to be a good backup in case of need, he's also shown himself to be versatile and can be used in certain situations even when injury isn't on the table. Now... How much John Gruden will choose to use him in that manner remains to be seen. But the potential is there, and he could really light some fire underneath our feet, bring a spark to our offense. But even if it just comes down, hey, Carr broke his leg and he's out for three weeks. I have absolute confidence in Marcus Mariota being able to pick up right where he left off and winning those games just as easily as Carr could have. And to be able to say that about a backup quarterback is unusual for the Raiders, and it is comforting, and I'm glad to be able to say it. Number one, let me just say, I hope that Derek Carr stays healthy all year. And that has nothing to do with my worries about Marcus Mariota, because I believe he can come in and be a capable backup. He proved that against the Chargers. Uh, but I hope to see Mariota on the field a lot during the coming year. Uh, as, as Homer's mentioned several times, running some of those RPO packages, particularly down closer to the end zone. And and I really think that if you have both those guys kind of switching in and out, it's going to really make it hard on those defenses to know what to prepare for. So uh, in addition to being the next man up, I hope to see Marcus Mariota out on the field quite a bit uh, during the course of the 2021 year. Yeah, that would be awesome to see him inside of the five-yard line running RPOs with this newly upgraded run-focused offensive line. You know, Marcus Mariota, I'm not even worried about him. I know that he'll be able to step right in next man up approach, that he did that. We saw that. That's what I, I love about this, you know, is having this type of quarterback that, yeah, like if we had this in 2016, we still had a shot to go to the playoffs, you know. That's why I was glad that they were able to keep him, right? They, I mean, they got him to restructure. Like, you know, Gruden, they say, is he really a quarterback whisperer? I mean, I don't know. He was in Marcus Mariota's ear and got him to restructure. You know, they really believe in this kid. I love how they're bringing him on slowly again in their system. You know, it shows that, you know, our front office, they're playing the long game. You know what I mean? They they got this approach that, I mean, we want these talented football players that want to be here and, and we're going to develop them and build this into a, an organization that is full of players, like Captain says a lot. Here lately, our players that don't make the team, they go somewhere else and, and thrive as well or get on a team as well. You know, and so that's because we are we have a good eye for talent. You know, we're just, you know, dealing with the cap structures and all this and that. But, you know, Marcus Mariota, you know that he can step right in and throw the deep ball to Waller all day long, you know. And you know that if he gets in trouble, he's going to run around and change it up. You know, and, and defenses, they can't prepare for him. You know, they can't prepare for Derek Carr and Marcus Mariota at the same time. So, man, you know, you know that your, your quarterback position is wrapped up with these two. And Marcus Mariota, man, I, I hope he does see the field a little bit more often. I mean, the, the options are endless in my mind with Marcus Mariota, and I'm glad we have him as a backup. Homer, do you know what I would love to see this year? 
I would love to see Derek Carr catch a touchdown pass from Marcus Mariota. That would be just awesome. You and me both, brother. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Okay, T3, how about bringing us your top three for this week? T3's top three. All right, here is this week's top three. Number one, I wanted to address the retirement of running backs coach Kirby Wilson. Now, I heard like everyone else in social media that with Wilson leaving, followed closely by the announcement of Mark Bedane stepping down as team president, that there were some cracks starting to form within the Raiders organization. Well, let me just say this. The Raiders are in fine shape right now, at least in this writer's opinion, and the only changes I see that really make any difference to any of us is the performance on the field. And that's coming. So good luck to Kirby Wilson and also to Mark Benane. But don't worry about the Raiders in Vegas. Just win, baby. Number two, Raiders.com's Eddie Pascal and KSNV News 3 Las Vegas' Jesse Merrick will break down everything they see in training camp, including key position battles, roster changes, and more in a special 10-part training camp series beginning this week on July 28th and it can be found exclusively on the Raiders Podcast Network, so make sure you tune in for that. And number three, if you're already starting to look at early betting angles, even though the regular season is nearly two months away, here are the early lines for the Raiders. They're listed as four-and-a-half-point underdogs in week one at home against the Ravens, as five-and-a-half-point underdogs on the road in week two versus Pittsburgh, a one-point underdog at home against Miami in week three, and is a four-point underdog against the Chargers in Los Angeles in week four. I may just have to get out my money early. That, ladies and gentlemen, is this week's top three. Thank you, T3. Yeah, I noticed that we hadn't mentioned the retirement of Kirby Wilson, and that was simply, I think, because we just had so much news in our news segment. Uh, Kirby is a great coach, who has long deserved his retirement. And I really do hope that he gets to go fishing with his boys and just sit down and relax and get away from the game. I think he's ready to enjoy it, and I I hope with all my heart that he is able to enjoy it. The Raiders Podcast Network, 10-part training camp series beginning July 28th. I'll have to check that out. That sounds like something that would be pretty interesting for fans anywhere in the world. And as far as underdogs and betting, a fool and their money are soon parted. Don't get me started. We're always going to be underdogs. You know, we, we you know you look at the roster. We got a young team. This you know, this organization went young, so of course we're not going to be listed, you know, as favorites in these games. Uh, But, you know, Vegas isn't always right. You know what I mean? So don't worry about it. I believe that this team is built the correct way through the draft with key veterans coming in to help these young kids become professionals. And now here we are, 2019 draft class turning into veterans themselves. We are on our way. I'm not worried about this. You know, don't worry about that. Now, Eddie Pascal, yeah, he's really good. And I'm glad that they're going to be doing this breakdown in training camp, I definitely will be listening in myself. Now, I was one of those fans. I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? When Kirby Wilson resigned and then Mark Bedane res- resigned. But you know what? Hey, I just calmed down and, and listened to some other people. But it still kind of, you know, kind of had me worried. You know, it's so close. You know, the Kirby Wilson one, though, still kind of has me worried because well, who's going to coach the running backs now? You know what I mean? We, you know, we got Drake coming in. We're expecting these two running backs to pretty much lead the way. Like, we're talking about this new offensive line that looks like it's focused and geared up to run the ball more. You know, now we don't have our running backs coach. You know, and we're going to bring somebody in new that's going to have to learn. You know, at least they have training camp, though, to learn, you know, what Drake's about and learn what uh, Josh Jacobs is about. Of course, Drake's uh, new anyways, but – uh, you know, Kirby Wilson had worked with Gruden before in Tampa. So there was that understanding. Now we'll see who Gruden brings in. But good luck to both of them in, in their in their lives and whatever they're going to do down the road. They have an assistant coach. He'll stay there. So it's not like they they have nobody. Yeah, but is he going to be as good as Kirby Wilson, you know? So maybe he's the one that was keeping Kirby together. Maybe. Just a thought. Could be. 
hopefully they just they're running just as well as they did, you know, last year. That's all I'm all I want. I think they're gonna be fine. All right. Give us a call at 904-701-8667. Leave us a voicemail or text message at that number or send in a message via social media and we will share your thoughts. And um, I did just want to say we had a follow-up on uh, the message last time with the GoFundMe. We we announced for Dawn and uh, James wrote in and let us know that 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 was his wife. And uh, just is thanking Raider Nation for your thoughts and prayers. So keep them in mind. Yeah, he sent me a message and thanked me and you guys for, you know, us, you know, putting that out there. That's what's cool about doing this is that small gestures like that mean a lot to people. You know what I mean? So shout out to James and his family. He wanted to thank us for... Not only presenting the link, but to making it just a little segment, just so everyone would understand uh, how important of a piece of news we were bringing and how important that is to Raider Nation. Uh, Because whenever anyone in Raider Nation hurts, we all hurt. And we all support you. And we're all there for you. So, James, Don, we're thinking about you. And this is just what makes us stronger as a fan base. And let's see, is it, have either of you been listening to the new Raider Roots podcast? I have. I, I have. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, coming up this week is going to be the year 1963. So that's the year that Al Davis actually comes in and takes over. And lots of changes start to happen. So make sure you tune in for episode three of Raider Roots podcast, which takes us to the year 1963. I feel guilty now because I didn't say yes, but I'm, you know, spoiled now with the streaming and all that that goes on. So I let the episodes stack up and then I binge listen. You know what I mean? So I'm definitely, I definitely mm-hmm. will be listening. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Whatever. T3. Sure. Hey, I'm okay. going to plug yeah. the hell out of it, though, we, okay? we have, I promise. We, we, have enough, we have enough episodes now that you can actually binge. All right. Yeah. I'm going to get on it for sure. Yeah, your, your excuse is over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. But I did feel guilty. Once we get to three episodes, you have to bench. <laughs> okay, okay. Deal. Okay, D3, why don't you tell us what Homer doesn't know? Hey, Homer, did you know? All right, now it's time for another edition of Hey, Homer, Did You Know? In this segment, I will ask Homer and Heidi... And the rest of our listening audience, a Raiders-related question with three possible answers to choose from. It's multiple choice, so just give it your best guess. So here goes. Here is this week's question. Who was the last Raider player to catch a touchdown pass in the playoffs for the Silver and Black? And I'll give you a hint. It happened at the end of the 2016 season. Was it A, Seth Roberts, B, Michael Crabtree, or C, Andre Holmes? Homer, what is your answer? I kind of want to say Michael Crabtree, but I think that's the obvious one. Here I go. Even though I said last time, don't overthink it. I'm overthinking now. Uh, Seth Roberts, you know, we talked about him being a steal as far as a free agent and what he did for us. But I don't remember a highlight of him catching a touchdown in that game. I'm just going to say C, Andre Holmes. All right. So. Heidi, he's, he's, he's gone A, then B, then C, and then stuck with C. So what do you think? I'm going to go with C, Andre Holmes, for different reasons. For one thing that I loved Andre Holmes. He was like one of my absolute favorite Raiders that nobody had ever heard of. But also um, because Connor Cook was playing, and Connor Cook was always playing, throwing to the lower string players, so... He's probably used to throwing to Holmes. So that makes more sense that way. But of course, it's probably Crabtree. The correct answer is C, Andre Holmes. Confetti all around. So everybody got this one correct. Andre Holmes 
caught the touchdown pass. Uh, there were two touchdowns by the Raiders in the game, uh, and this one was by passing. So Andre Holmes was the recipient of the touchdown in the playoffs at the end of the 2016 season. So there is your answer, Andre Holmes. So everybody wins today. Hey, we're on a two-game win streak or a two-episode win streak. Well, I just figured, you know, they, those two always play together in practice, so the, that made the most sense. There you so. go. All right. Homer, you did know. Yes, I did. Ah, I'm ah, proud ah. of you. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Ha, ha, ha. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. You did. Thank God. I'm now you get to, now you, get to introduce, you get to introduce the next segment. Oh, yeah. And now, Raider Nation, it's time for Heidi's Heroes. From drug addict to grocery store clerk to NFL practice squad player to NFL star, Darren Waller has lived quite the life this past decade. In order to give back, the Las Vegas Raiders tight end held a youth football camp this last Thursday. Boys and girls ages from 3rd grade through 8th grade were handpicked by the city of Las Vegas to participate in the camp and meet Waller. About 100 of them took part in the camp under the lights in the late afternoon where they were encouraged to have fun and make a difference in their communities of need. While this was a first-time event, Waller hopes to make it an annual event. It was sponsored by the Mayor's Fund for Las Vegas Life, which is a vehicle for corporate and philanthropic partners to support innovative programs that improve quality of life for all Las Vegas residents with a special focus on vulnerable populations. Waller feels led to work with these populations and hopefully we'll be seeing him out there doing it again very soon. What a fantastic story and it just keeps getting better. And I, I, I want to just say how proud I am of Darren Waller sticking with his sobriety, sticking with his goal and his dreams and passing it along to future generations. He is already making a name for himself in Las Vegas and he's made an impression on many, many youth already as much as well as many of the Raider fan base. And I just see that continuing. I see lots of 83 jerseys out there and I will just continue to see them uh, over the coming years. So, uh, so kudos, excellent job to Darren Waller, uh, a high, a Heidi's hero to be sure. You know, I'm excited for this guy. You know, he's done some great things in his life. You know, now, uh, you know, one number one is being, you know, overcoming what he has overcome. And now, you know, he's giving back to his community, continues to give back to his community. I know, you know, going down a dark road myself, how much, how good it feels to give back to your community. And I can see this guy doing that for a long, long time to come. You know, when you do things like that, it really, changes the wiring in your head. So uh, coming from what he was coming from, you know, it, you know, and what I was coming from, it really it feels good, you know, to do good. And so, you know, kudos to him because I know how it feels to do what he's doing. And I hope that he continues to do it because he's doing it well. All right. And that about does it for this week on the Only Nation podcast. If you'd like to help support the show, buy us a hot dog at buymeacoffee.com slash onlynationpod. You can find me, Heidi Stabbert, on social media as at Kevlar Prom Dress on Twitter and Instagram or Heidi Stabbert on Facebook. You can also find me on YouTube on Captain Jack Rackham's channel every other Tuesday night. I join the DC wench, Peggy Holmes, and Angria Trask on the Captain and His Wenches show. All right, Raider Nation, we brought you a lot of content during the offseason, but training camp is here. So we are not going without football for the rest of the year. So stay tuned to the Only Nation podcast. And you can find me, Raider Homer, by going to the theraiderhomerchannel.buzzsprout.com. There you will find links to all my social media accounts as well as to my podcasts. And please go to chuckystubs.com. That's www.chuckystubs.com and get some awesome Raider Nation merch. You can enter the code HOMER to get 15% off, and they are also going to have a flag challenge, which if you get take their flag into the stadium and get it shown on TV, 
You can send them some footage of that and they'll give you 500 bucks. So just go to chuckystugs.com and buy their flag and put in promo code HOMERFLAG to get $10 off of your purchase. All right, raise that flag. All right, Raider Nation. Training camp is upon us and our season is just getting warmed up. So now that you've listened to our show, here's what you need to do. Send us your name and address so we can send you some free Raider swag. Call us and tell us what you want to know. Throw us an interesting nugget that we can use on one of our upcoming episodes and become a part of what we're doing here. Remember, this is the only nation, and we want you to be a part of it. So call us, 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. Call us now and join the Only Nation podcast family. And there are two easy ways to find me on social media. You can send me a tweet at T3 underscore sports 703, as several of you do. Or you can hit me up on Facebook at Tom, T-H-O-M, Jones. I will do my best to respond back, and I would love to include your comments on an upcoming show. And we thank you for tuning in and also getting involved. And I also want to personally thank everyone for all the additional support and feedback on the Raider Roots podcast, which is up and running. And we hope that you join in every week to get more information on Raiders and Raiders history. As always, we look forward to hearing from you, everyone. Until next time, go Raiders. Go Raiders. We are not just a nation, we are the only nation.